some say an abandoned house near the Old West ghost town of Christmas, Arizona is haunted. Possibly. But maybe the restless spirit or spirits don't belong to ghosts. Perhaps it's Saint Nick looking for a warm, quiet, isolated spot to indulge in some R&R. After all, it's gotta be hard work to get all those orders ready in time to dash around the globe delivering presents to the world's good little boys and girls in one night, right? Christmas Arizona sounds like a perfect place for him to unwind and enjoy some peace and quiet, doesn't it? Haunted places with Christmas names, both secular and religious, are what we're exploring in this first episode of Haunted Christmas, the second theme season here on the Haunt Johns podcast. Thanks for joining me. So let's ho 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 hop to it and get this series started. Hello fellow restless spirit, thank you so much for tuning in to spend part of your holiday season with me. This season we'll venture to several places, starting with this episode where we'll check out haunted places with Christmas names, including cemeteries, state parks, and cities that all share something in common, paranormal activity, and names of things commonly associated with Christmas. But before we get started, I'll pause to remind you to subscribe if you haven't already. That way you won't miss any of the rest of the episodes in this series, or any of the others that we have planned for next year. I'll elaborate more on what those will be in our last episode for this series, which will be about places to spend a spirited New Year's Eve. It'll drop on Monday, December 27th. So see, just a short season this time, so you won't have to wait too long to find out what we've got planned for 2022. But for now, let's ring in the season by exploring haunted places with Christmas names. We'll start with what we always see the most of at this time of year. Sometimes they go up earlier than others, but it's usually the first clue the holiday season is upon us. I'm talking about decorations, of course, specifically the most traditional kind, greenery. I found three cemeteries with alleged paranormal activity that have evergreen in their names. In some cases, it's the name of the cemetery itself. In others, it's the name of both the cemetery and the city it's located in. We'll begin with Evergreen Cemetery in Owego, New York. PBS's Haunted History described the 51-acre cemetery as being situated on a beautifully landscaped terraced hillside. One grave in particular is marked by an obelisk that overlooks the town of Owego below. It belongs to Sasana Loft, a Mohawk Indian maiden who was killed in a train crash in the area. She had converted to Christianity and enthusiastically spread the gospel in that area. The people were so saddened by her tragic death that they raised the money for her obelisk, wanting to not only erect something in her honor and memory, but to also bury her in their cemetery. However, Sasana's family wanted to bring her home with them, but the people of Owego won out, and Sasana was buried there. Some say that shortly after her, her internment, soft voices chanting Mohawk songs floated out from the woods. Was it her ancestors come to comfort her, or family members quietly grieving unseen and sheltered by the trees? I don't know. 
But now we're going to jaunt on down to the Deep South for this next one and visit the McConaughey Cemetery, which the Denver Post listed among their picks for top 10 haunted cemeteries because, quote, Phantom Union soldiers have been seen riding their horses across the graveyard while ghostly troops march with bandages around their heads. Well, that sounded interesting, so I decided to do some more digging. That's how I came across a post on Ghostly World about the cemetery, which included a few more specifics about the haunting, but also something else I noticed. It listed the cemetery's location as Claiborne, Alabama, which was a bummer because the Denver Post had listed it in Evergreen, Alabama, and how was I supposed to include it in this episode of Haunted Places with Christmas Names if it didn't really have one? Here's why I decided to keep it. Because eventually, it did lead me to a haunted evergreen place in Alabama, as well as another Christmas tidbit, even though that one's not necessarily haunted. Anyway, Ghostly World reported that the first people to spot the Union soldier ghosts were Captain Charles Lachlan and his wife in the fall of 1865. They were in their carriage one fall morning when two rows of gray horses ridden by 12 Union soldiers passed on either side of them, so six on each side. They noted details like how the soldiers' white-gloved hands crossed over the pommel on their saddles and how there were bandages wrapped around their heads. Now, Ghostly World went on to report that the Lachlans also witnessed another apparition who they believed was Lafayette Sigler, a Confederate soldier known for his particularly gruesome ambushes on Union soldiers. Once he killed them, he'd chop off their ears and collect them. But that's maybe not exactly how the story went. Among the references that Ghostly World noted for the McConaughey Cemetery haunting was Dennis Hawk's Haunted Places, the National Directory. Well, I happen to have a copy of, I'm going to call it the Haunted Places Directory because I'm going to refer to it a little bit more from here on out. So I whipped it out and saw Hawk had also noted, um, quote, the two respected citizens were certain they had seen victims of Confederate soldier Lafayette Sigler. So it wasn't a matter that they had also spotted his ghost chasing the soldiers, but who knows, maybe it has happened, but that wasn't, I think, how originally the story went. Anyway, Hawk also listed the cemetery as being in Claiborne, but Google listed it as being in Frisco City, Alabama with the zip code 36445. I decided to see which city came up for 36445, and as is the case when there are many small towns clustered near each other, it turns out that the zip code covers several towns, including both Claiborne and Frisco City, but not evergreen. Crud. Well, what was I supposed to do then? However, this is what happened. So when I pulled out the Haunted Places directory, on the page next to the Claiborne, Alabama slash McConaughey Cemetery entry was one for Evergreen, Alabama. Apparently, it said that a 40-mile stretch of I-65 that runs between the towns of Evergreen and Conica County, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, it's C-O-N-C-U-H, and Greenville in Butler County is built over Sacred Creek Indian burial grounds. Side note, I have the updated and revised edition of the Haunted Places directory as of 2002. So not only does it use the word Indian instead of the now more politically correct Native American, it might also prove that this particular entry hasn't been updated since the, fir the book's first printing in 1994. Anyway, Hawk wrote that the road is even, straight, and well-maintained, but the accident rate is well above average. He also included a stat that from 1984 to 1990, 
there were 519 accidents, resulting in 208 injuries and 23 deaths on this portion of I-65. Well, that does seem like a lot in only six years, especially for a lower density stretch of interstate, especially if it's pretty straight and it doesn't seem like there should be a reason for so many accidents. You know, if there's uh, no other turnpikes or anything, which there isn't, it's just 65. But is the accident rate really any higher than other portions of I-65 through Alabama? And does that still remain the case, you know, today as it did back then? I'm not 100% positive, but for some reason that stretch of highway rang a bell. I do remember driving that way when the USTA team that I was on won state in 2012. Nashville is a straight shot down I-65 to Mobile, and that's where sectionals was being played, so that's the route we took, um, because that's what happens when you win states and you get a, when you win state, you get to go to sectionals. Anyway, so there had been a traffic snarling accident on our way down, but I couldn't tell you for sure which part of 65 had been. I know we were in Alabama at that point. But I don't remember if it was before Montgomery or after. Um, and we ended up getting off the highway and taking some back roads for several miles. And then we got back on, you know, after we passed the, the pile up. But I was curious if I could find anything out about that stress of or that stretch of highway. So I googled trouble spots I-65 Alabama crash rates. I know, I'm not the best Googler, but this is what I found. It, it did turn something up. The very first article to pop up was one dated June 19th, 2021 from WBRC with the headline, Nine Juveniles, One Adult, Killed in Saturday's Horrific I-65 Crash in Butler County. Oh my God, so that's right where we're talking about. But also, that is maybe why it sounded familiar. Because as soon as I saw the headline, I remembered seeing the wreck on both the national and local news this past summer. So I scanned the article just to see if there was any mention about the area being a trouble spot. And in a way, it did say something about that. Butler County Coroner Wayne Garlock was quoted as saying, that particular area of the accident is prone to hydroplaning. At the time of the article, an official investigation of the crash was underway, but it had been raining that day and they did suspect hydroplaning played a part in the wreck that involved 17 vehicles, seven of which caught fire and the whole wreck that resulted in 10 dead. We often hear of houses having paranormal activity, because they've been built over Native American burial grounds. But in interstate? Have you ever heard of such a thing? If so, let me know. Send an email to podcast at hauntjaunts.net. I would really love to hear about it and where this section of whatever interstate it may be is. But now that we know about this one, in case you're like me and never knew about it before either, that is, We'll know to drive extra careful on this part of I-65 when passing through Evergreen in Conica County and Greenville in Butler County, Alabama. Because I don't know about you, but house hauntings don't claim multiple lives all at once. But highway hauntings, well, if that's real, then they seem to, and this may be a proof of that. Speaking of Alabama counties, that's how I discovered another Christmas connection of sorts, but this is the one that I said wasn't really paranormal though, but I think it's sort of neat just the same. When I was trying to figure out which city McConaughey Cemetery was in, I googled the sub cemetery name and Alabama city. One of the descriptions was a cemetery in Monroe County, Alabama. But a description for Monroeville, which is the county seat of Monroe County, also popped up, and part of it caught my attention. 
It said both Monroeville and Monroe County are designated as the literary capital of Alabama. My first thought was, Alabama has a literary capital? So off I went down that rabbit hole. Turns out Monroeville and Monroe County are designated Alabama's literary capital because that's the birthplace of Harper Lee and the childhood home of her friend and fellow writer Truman Capote. Harper Lee's novel To Kill a Mockingbird was published in July 1960, but the movie version of it premiered on Christmas Day, December 25th, 1962. So, in the end, the cemetery that I thought was in Evergreen, Alabama wasn't, but thanks to Ghostly World and Dennis Hawk's Haunted Places directory, we ended up in Evergreen, Alabama anyway, with a few haunting pit stops along the way. Now we're going to jaunt on up north a bit to Evergreen Park, Illinois, and the haunted hitchhiker who's said to haunt its Evergreen Cemetery. This haunting is also listed in the Haunted Places directory, as well as online at hauntedplaces.org. The book describes the ghost as a brunette girl, while the website says she's a teenager. At any rate, we know she's younger rather than older. Both agree she's thought to be buried in the cemetery, but her restless spirit prefers to hitchhike. At least in the 1980s she did. But it wasn't just cars she'd hitch rides in. Hawk's book even includes an account where she got on a CTA bus, without paying, of course, because what do ghosts need money for? But rules are rules, so the driver went to confront her about trying to ride for free. Well, she did what any ghost might do. She vanished in front of him. Either from fright, embarrassment, or just because she could, I don't know. But um, if you happen to pass through the west part of Chicago and see a girl hitchhiking, just know there's a good chance she's only along for the ride for a short while and may not even say goodbye before it's over. And don't expect a tip. Moving on to another popular Christmas time symbol, let's talk snowflakes. Well, singular, not plural in this case, Snowflake, Arizona. It's the site of one of the most well-known UFO abduction cases in U.S. history. This is the one the 1993 movie Fire in the Sky was based on. On November 6, 1975, Travis Walton and six of his co-workers claimed to have seen a UFO while they were driving. They stopped, Walton got out to take a closer look, and that's when allegedly he was beamed up. His co-workers fled in terror, but when they went back to get him, he was gone and he stayed gone for five days. Whether his story is true or not has been the subject of great debate, but for the purposes of this episode, it makes for a haunting tale with a Christmas connection of sorts. We've had some evergreen and a snowflake, but what about some holly and more UFOs? which may or may not be Santa's sleigh pulled by a reindeer. Let's drop back down to Holly Pond, Alabama for this next one. It's not an abduction case this time, though. On October 13, 2013, a witness reported an unidentified low-flying black triangle-shaped object in the skies near Holly Pond, according to the MUFON network. UFOhunters.com also lists that report, as well as another one that happened in the area a few years later on March 15, 2018. 
This time the witness noticed three round balls glowing that didn't cast any light, as well as a little blinking red light on the very back on the top of the black triangle-shaped craft. We like to stereotype Santa as driving a sleigh, but let's think about this for a moment. It's really not very practical. A UFO, on the other hand, well, now we're talking some advantages that solve a lot of mysteries, especially stealth and speed. That does make a lot more sense how Old St. Nick can traverse the entire globe so fast, doesn't it? Perhaps these off-season Holly Pond sightings were a test run or maybe even a test drive of a new sleigh, so to speak. Or, kind of like Christmas, Arizona, a place where Santa and the elves retreat for vacation or something. And maybe for sentiment's sake, Santa keeps a red light on his craft in honor of Rudolph. Speaking of the red-nosed reindeer, in the 1960s stop-motion animated TV special, Donner is Rudolph's dad. Let's jaunt out west to a place that is definitely not named in honor of one of Santa's reindeer, who may or may not be Rudolph's dad, but does share his same name. Donner Memorial State Park in Truckee, California. The Donner Party found themselves snowbound and stranded in the Sierra Nevadas during the winter of 1846 to 1847. The group started off with 81 pioneers. Only 45 were alive and able to leave that spring. History reported that about half resorted to cannibalism in order to survive. But what's interesting about that is I don't know if they all talked about it beforehand, but in December 1846, 15 of the Donner Party's strongest members left in search of help. But after several days, they were starving and about to die and decided the only sure food source was one of them. But would they draw lots for human sacrifice or have a duel and then eat the loser? They didn't have to resign themselves to either of those dilemmas. Instead, they roasted and ate those who ended up dying of natural causes, which happened pretty soon because they were all kind of in a bad way at that point. So that enabled seven of them to get to a ranch where they started organizing help to rescue everybody else. Back at camp, about half of them also decided to resort to cannibalism in order to survive. Again, they ate those who died on their own. They didn't really kill anybody. Um, however, the last survivor to be rescued was Louis Kiesberg. I'm not sure I'm saying his right. Kiesberg, K-E-S-E-B-E-R-G, who history reported was found in April 1847, supposedly half mad and surrounded by the cannibalized bodies of his former companions. He was accused but never convicted of murdering others to eat them. An article in the Toronto Sun called the horror these pioneers endured an ordeal by hunger. With such a gruesome history, it's no wonder some say this area, Donner Memorial State Park, is haunted. One of the ghosts many believe haunt the area is Tamsin Donner, the wife of the Donner Party's leader, George. When help came for them, she sent the children along but stayed behind with her husband, who was too sick and too weak to travel. They both ended up dying, but some say her restless spirit still roams the area. Is that the yellowish figure hovering above the ground that some claim to have witnessed? Or is it the spirit of one of the other victims of that ill-fated expedition? (music) 
Speaking of yellow, you'll find the ghosts of yellow fever victims, as well as pirates, plantation owners, slaves, and even American Revolutionary War soldiers in the place we're headed next, which we've covered the secular side of the haunted places with Christmas names spectrum. We'll wrap up by jaunting to a couple with religious names, starting with St. Mary's, Georgia. Some say the Oak Grove Cemetery in St. Mary's is haunted, but it's not the small coastal city's most notable haunt. Although the Spanish moss-draped live oaks do enhance the atmosphere. Two other places, however, specifically an antebellum mansion turned museum and a hotel, are more popular destinations for ghost hunters and haunted history enthusiasts. There are other houses rumored to be haunted in St. Mary's, which you would expect given the, the city's long history, but none capture the imagination more than the Orange Hall House Museum, which the city regards as its crown jewel. And rightly so. It definitely took my breath away the first time I saw it when we went to St. Mary's to catch the ferry for a day trip to Cumberland Island, which St. Mary's is the gateway for. And without knowing anything about the city's history, or the house's history, I couldn't help but wonder if it was haunted. Again, both the city and the house, but mostly that house because it is just beautiful. I later learned, of course, that yes, it did have ghost stories associated with it. Everything from people claiming to see apparitions to hearing strange, unexplainable sounds and witnessing strange, unexplainable activity. And I'm now talking about the house. Construction on the Greek Revival-style mansion was completed in 1838. Its first resident was Horace Southworth Pratt, a Presbyterian minister who'd arrived in St. Mary's in the early 1820s and established the First Presbyterian Church. His wife, Jane, died in 1829 and never lived in Orange Hall. However, she was the love of Horace's life, who did remarry a few years after her death. It's rumored he named his daughter Jane after her, but Jane also met an early end by dying of yellow fever in childhood. Some say she may be the little ghost girl who is said to haunt Orange Hall. But she's not the only one. Two other spirits are also said to roam there, a man and a woman. It really is such a lovely place, I'm really surprised there aren't more restless spirits who remain there. Especially considering its history. During the Civil War, it became the headquarters for the 9th Maine Volunteer Union Army. After the war, it's been everything from a private residence again, to an apartment building, to even the city library. Now it's a museum that is sometimes open for tours, and sometimes even gives ghost tours. Then there's St. Mary's Riverview Hotel, with waterfront views right across from the ferry. Over the years, notable guests who have stayed there include business magnate John D. Rockefeller Sr., author Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, industrialist Andrew Carnegie, and even weatherman Willard Scott. Each of the hotel's 20 rooms are named after some of the famous guests, such as number 10 Carnegie, number 17 Rockefeller, and number 11 Willard Scott. But it's room number 8, the Brandon, which is rumored to be haunted by a male spirit who, as Haunted Rooms put it, likes to mess around with the lights. The most shared story about the room says that when the hotel suffered a power outage, the lights in room 8 still stayed on. Speaking of lights, we'll head to our last stop on this tour of haunted places with Christmas names. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. That's where we're going next. (music) 
there are a few listings for Bethlehem in Dennis Hawk's Haunted Places directory, including what he called a cantankerous ghost who pesters students and employees in the Linderman Library at Lehigh University. Moravian College is also said to be home to a number of ghosts, including what Hawk described as noisy spirits who dwell in the tunnels under the South Campus, as well as an elderly couple who has been spotted in a woman's dorm. War-era ghosts have also been reported at the college, including a Revolutionary War nurse and a young man who died during World War I. But ghosts aren't the only type of paranormal activity people have reported in Bethlehem, PA. There have been several UFO sightings here too, some even fairly recently, but none right around Christmas really. However, my favorite Bethlehem haunt involves a haunted hotel, which is especially fitting for this part of the episode where we're focusing on haunted places with religious names. In the mid-1700s, the Moravians built the first house in the area on the spot where the present-day hotel now stands. In the late 1700s, they then built the first hotel on that spot, the Eagle Hotel. The present-day luxury hotel, the historic Hotel Bethlehem, was built in 1922 and stands in the heart of historic Moravian Bethlehem which is a U.S. National Historic Landmark District. It's believed that four restless spirits reside in the hotel, three of which they're pretty sure they know the identities of, but one that remains a mystery. Let's start with Francis Daddy Thomas, a.k.a. Bethlehem's Town Guide. He was a German immigrant who arrived in the colonies when he was six years old. He became a cabinet maker and was married to his wife for 53 years, but they never had any children. However, they did raise three children of missionaries sent to Bethlehem to attend the girls' seminary. He sounds like he was a really nice guy willing to help anyone out, and he especially loved assisting visitors to Bethlehem. He died in 1822, but on the historic hotel Bethlehem's website, they say many believe he still attends to Bethlehem's visitors and guests with a wonderful sense of fun and humor. His ghost is most often seen in the boiler room part of the hotel. Then there's the barefoot ghost of Mrs. Bronk. For a short time in the 1800s, when it was still the Eagle Hotel, her and her husband were the hotel's landlords. But the arrangement didn't last long, maybe six months. Her husband liked to drink with the guests a little too much. Rather, he liked to drink a little too much. Drinking with the guests was just another excuse to imbibe some more. His wife preferred not to wear stockings or shoes, which in 1833 was considered quite scandalous. But I love how the account was related on the hotel's website, so let me read that. Guests off the just-arriving stagecoach would be greeted most politely and to their shock and mortification would find her pedal extremities completely exposed. (laughs) Pedal extremities, that's hilarious. Kitchen, it's accurate, but hilarious. Anyway, so kitchen staff and guests have reported seeing a woman in period clothing with bare feet in the kitchen and restaurant area of the hotel, so many believe it's likely the ghost of the former landlord, Mrs. Brong. Another ghost with a connection to the old Eagle Hotel is the singer May Yohi. Her grandfather owned and operated the hotel, and she was born there in 1866. Even as a child, she would sing and dance for guests, and she was so talented, the Moravians pooled their money to send her to Paris for operatic training, and she became a stage star. Performing in England for Queen Victoria's son, Prince Edward, is how she ended up meeting and marrying Lord Francis Clinton Hope 
who owned a famous and storied stone you may have heard of, the Hope Diamond, which some believe is cursed. Lady Frances Hope, as May became known, did wear the stone a few times. I'm not sure if that's why she turned out to not be very lucky in love, but at the turn of the century, she divorced her husband and married an American soldier, but later ended up divorcing him, too. Were her happiest times singing and dancing in the hotel's lobby? Is that why sometimes the piano player turns on all by itself? And is that who some say they hear singing and dancing, especially in the lobby and the third floor exercise room? No one's 100% positive, of course, but they do believe it's possible. Then there's the curious case of room 932 on the ninth floor, which the hotel fondly refers to as their room with a boo. They don't know who haunts it or why, but as the hotel put it, it has been the site of some peculiar paranormal activity. They report that one couple staying in the room was awoken by a man standing by their bed asking them why they were in his room. When they turned on the lights, no one was there, which would be very disconcerting. Many people have also reported seeing reflections in the mirror that disappear moments later, and objects move such as paper standing upright or flying off the desk altogether, and lamps flashing on and off are also commonly reported experiences. Someone even reported the bathroom wallpaper suddenly turning pink. When the hotel invited a paranormal investigator to stay overnight in the room in 2007, he caught EVPs that said, It's Mary. And what a beautiful bathroom. I've locked myself in the closet. And look out the window. Apparently the room does have a lovely view which is why they call it a room with a boo, that may or may not be haunted by a woman named Mary, in addition to others. Thank you so much for tuning in to this first episode of the Haunted Christmas Season here on the Haunt Johns Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this audio jaunt to haunted places with Christmas names. Next week, we'll explore the best places to find the ghosts of Christmas past. And the best way to ensure you don't miss that is to subscribe. Until we sail the airwaves together again, Ciao for now.